and today we have um, two special guests, but prior to our introduction of them, I'm going to introduce you to Betsy. She's going to ask uh, for a few moments of your time. She needs to tell you about the music she gets this show. Oh, now. Yay, that's uh, better. Yeah. Now Betsy doesn't have to show. <coughs> I might anyway just to irritate you. Hi, I'm Betsy. I'm the executive director of the chamber, and I welcome you. Uh, today's subject is near and dear to everyone in this room, so glad you're here. Um, I just had a quick announcement. Um, you're aware of our organization called Coastal Young Professionals Network. How many of you are members of that network? We have a few in the room, all right. So um, I think it, is it loud enough? Okay. Um, about a year ago, our board of directors determined that we would now allow people to join Coastal Young Professionals Network at no charge. And that's if their companies or their organizations are members of the chamber. Um, now, we have really ramped up the program. There are many, many exciting things going on, both in career development and in social kinds of um, activities. And um, I don't know how many of you went to the last October feast. We had upward of 400 people. It was one of the most exciting young professional events that I've ever seen. Uh, of course, I had to kind of be over against the wall. But, um, but yeah, it was just the energy in the room was absolutely phenomenal. Now, as an employer, if you're an employer of young professionals, I would encourage you to have, ask them to invite them to join. There is no fee. All they need to do is go to a particular link. I have cards up here that you can hand all your young professionals and just invite them. Say, you know, because you're a young professional and because you work for us, you can be a member of Coastal Young Professionals Network, and here are the benefits. Um, all they need to do is go, sign up, put their name and their email address and a couple of other pieces of information, and they're in. And then they'll receive all the communications and all the promotions for the events down the road. And hopefully they'll even become involved as volunteers for the organization. It's a powerful <coughs> group of young people. So um, I have the cards. If anybody would like any, um, I'm at the second table here, or I'll see you after the meeting. Um, but please take advantage of these. They're great cards to just hand out, and it's, it's, they're self-explanatory. Thanks very much. Thank you, Betsy. So we're here to um, listen to two gentlemen this morning. Um, we have Dane Chekolinski. He has uh, originally came from Marengo, Illinois, which is a very small suburb in the north uh, half of Illinois. Um, he began here in 2011 as the third director of the SCEDC. He is married with one daughter named Mary. Um, and we have Jose, who has been here for uh, eight years as a partner for community development. He worked with them, and then he has just recently moved from May of 2014 to begin the Hispanic Chamber. He is also married with one child named Bianca. If you give a warm welcome to Dave and then to Jose. Again, my name is Dane Chekolinski. I'm the director with the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. And I'm going to kick things off here a little bit by framing up a little bit of the challenges that we're seeing, a little bit of how we got connected with the Hispanic Chamber. Then I'll turn it over to Jose for all the, the fine details and probably what you want to hear. So I work with the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. By show of hands, how many know what that organization is? We have heard of it. Okay, outstanding. Um, Essentially, you know, we were created to try to grow jobs in the local area. And about a year and a half, two years ago roughly, the conversations we were having with companies started fundamentally changing. It went from, I need capital, into, oh my gosh, I have orders, and I can't fill the jobs that I do have. And those conversations have only gotten stronger and stronger. And as a result, we have several irons in the fire in the workforce realm. You can learn more about those on September 22nd with the Sheboygan County Chamber, the SCDC, and Inspire are hosting a workforce development summit that you are all are invited to. But uh, as with this particular topic and this particular item, the things <laughs> the companies were telling me about workers, you know, that uh, they would they'd have plenty of people apply. But when they would show up, they were not well dressed, horribly bad dressed. Good pat I'm serious, these are the comments right from HR professionals. I'm not even joking, and I purposely mentioned that one for several different reasons, because 
I, I know that the response is internal, but this isn't funny. At, at the end of the day, we have companies, we have over 2,000 available jobs in the county. And we have probably 1,000 people sitting on the sidelines or underemployed that frankly don't want to be there, right? And, and this solution is the only one I've yet seen that is a market-driven solution to break the poverty cycle, give someone the tools and motivation they need to find a family-sustaining job. That's what we're going to be talking about here and how the Hispanic Chamber has framed that up. And uh, how this connection happened, really, was uh, um, actually happened through the Chamber. Uh, both Jose and myself were both in uh, the leadership program, which I know the new class is just starting. We got to know each other. Jose took another job. Uh, long story short, short, I attempted to hire him. It did not work. <laughs> so I had some very awkward conversations originally with the Hispanic Chamber. You know, when you kind of get in that awkward situation, everyone's like, oh, we want to work with you, we want to work with you. And we just started laying out each other's problems and realized that there was, there was something there. Um, so we had Jose come up, do a couple presentations to some business leaders in the community, and uh, that presentation that he showed them, I believe, is the baseline for his presentation today. But I, I just want to say that, you know, there are real workforce challenges. We could grow our local economy, but it's going to involve getting that last set of people off the bench and into the game. And I think uh, Jose's group here has probably the best laid out plan I've seen yet to date that can accomplish that. So without any more ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jose. So Jose, thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Is it afternoon yet? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce for having us here. Um, and uh, it's great to be uh, in front of you today. Uh, a lot of people that I've known throughout the years told me, you need to move? I'm like, no, I'm still here. I'm still in Sheboygan. So I uh, just wanted to, uh, to mention that. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and how we're collaborating and partnering here with uh, SEDC and the Chamber of Commerce in Sheboygan. And not one of those things that we do at the Hispanic Chamber is a collaboration. We want to make sure that we're collaborating with as many organizations as we can, because we know we cannot do everything ourselves and solve all these issues, huge issues we have, specifically in the workforce development side, by ourselves. <coughs> um, so, uh, again, as So we're going to be uh, flying through a little bit through uh, through some uh, uh, slides here, but please uh, stop me if you have any questions. We're going to be talking a little bit about this uh, this solution. I'm going to share a little bit about the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, frame up a little bit of the problem that we're seeing on a statewide basis. Uh, talk a little bit about industry leadership and how we uh, need to engage the leaders of our industry, our manufacturing industry. Um, and how we create those strategic partnerships between the public and the private sector in order to solve this uh, huge uh, problem we have in front of us. And how that uh, it turns into this uh, private-public training initiative solution. And, uh, and then going back into the bigger picture and how we're working on uh, this workforce investment fund uh, that's going to help us deal with this solution in a more macro uh, way and the economic impact that will create uh, in the state of Wisconsin and what the immediate action items would be in order, in order for us to get there. <laughs> so the Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce, for uh, or many of you that may, may not have heard of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we're a 40 plus year old organization. We uh, have our headquarters in Milwaukee. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're community development focused and uh, our post Four main areas of work are economic, workforce development, academic, and community development. We represent the interest of about 600,000 Hispanics in the, in the state of Wisconsin, about 10,000 Hispanic-owned businesses, most of them uh, small businesses. And we have offices right now, as I mentioned, Milwaukee, Sheboygan, 
my office is based out of here, although sometimes on some weeks I don't spend any time in that office, but I have an office here, um, right at Pigs Cafe. We uh, truly appreciate the partnership with Pigs Cafe as well. Uh, Green Bay, Wassa, we have an office in Appleton, uh, Fox Cities area. Uh, we just opened up a few months ago an office in Madison, Wisconsin, and we do a lot of our public policy uh, work out of that office. And uh, we're finishing up uh, the details for opening up an office as well in Racine, Kenosha area. And our goal is to be in 16, uh, the 16 metropolitan statistical areas around the state of Wisconsin. And one of the things that we look at when we're opening uh, offices is where are the nearest technical colleges uh, to that area because our partnership involves uh, and our, our work uh, has to be involving the technical colleges on, uh, around the state. So we have a good partnership with many of the technical colleges. We have established a connection here in Sheboygan as well with uh, Dr. Lancer and his crew. And we're going to be working together in order to develop some uh, uh, programs as well here in Sheboygan. Uh, and we have a good uh, relationship as well with the Wisconsin uh, Technical Colleges Association. <coughs> so uh, a little bit of the magnitude, uh, magnitude of the problem here uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, the Department of uh, Workforce Development came up with some numbers uh, at the end, tail, tail end of last year. They estimated that in uh, over the next eight years there were going to be 760,000 job openings uh, and replacement positions to be filled in Wisconsin. Uh, we know what the unemployment rate is uh, today in Wisconsin is about five, uh, or uh, nationally is about 5.3%. Uh, it's the lowest it's been in in many years, and we know that, for example, the unemployment rate here in Sheboygan is under 4%, uh, or about 4.2. <coughs> uh, so uh, we believe that the magnitude of the problem is underappreciated by both the public and the private sector. Um, what we call is uh, a lot of companies that are still living in the old economy type of frame of mind. You know, we have jobs, why aren't we filling them? Why aren't people coming? And it's really because the unemployment rate is so low that there's not many people available. We know that the, uh, the rate of people leaving the workforce because, because of retirements to the people coming into the workforce is about three to one. So for every three jobs that are were, or three people were losing from the workforce because of retirement, there's only one person coming in. So that's a huge challenge that we're uh, facing, and obviously that endangers uh, our uh, ability to compete with other states and other, and other countries. Um, we know for the, pro uh, pro uh, the work we do that this is something that Canada is facing, and this is something that uh, Mexico is facing. We were actually contacted by the ambassador of Mexico, and he said, how can you help me out bringing people back to Mexico? Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> you just elect Donald Trump and we'll be there. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> We're not bipartisan. Not, not partisan. <laughs> we work with everyone and anyone. <laughs> so what we're learning from employers, and I think uh, we're preaching to the choir here, is uh, difficult to fill new and skilled labor jobs uh, due to the growth of the companies. Companies are experiencing tremendous growth. We, we were hearing from uh, companies here in the, in the county as well. You're growing, and you can't find people. And then you have uh, the retirement uh, uh, problem, and you have an aging workforce. An average is about 45 years old in, in the workforce. We hear, for example, uh, the welding industry, the average for welders around the state of Wisconsin is about 56 years old. And those are individuals that have been in the workforce for about two years. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you guys. If anybody's got a pickup truck, like four pickup truck greeters out, the windows are open, it's raining outside, you're getting wet inside. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's got a pickup truck outside with the windows open, you got a bike on it all cold. Just let me know, there's nobody out here, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. That's kind. All right. I'm glad I don't drive a um, So we know that the average for manufacturing employers or employees, especially those in the in, in the manufacturing floor, it's, it's it's high, and we know there's a shortage in engineering, science, informational uh, information technology, what we call STEM, and now it's switching to STEAM, science, technology, information, arts, and math. So there's also a shortage for, for those uh, 
those individuals in the arts uh, programs. We know there's this, the industry cannibalization, and which is product of the low unemployment rates and companies needing uh, uh, employees. And what we know is that there's there's a supply diversity problem that gets created, or a supply chain a problem that gets uh, created there because many big companies that are kind of cannibalizing employees from other smaller companies because they can pay higher wages and they can they have better benefits, use those small companies as supply. They supply the bigger companies. So then you know we're we're disrupting the process. And obviously the local and state economy suffers. And one of the things that we've learned is that the skilled workers are often unemployable due to life skills. The technical skills, if you uh, bring somebody into your company that has an open mind, that's willing to learn and wants to learn, you can teach them those technical skills. It's the soft skills that are missing. So as, as I think was talk, touching on is we see a lot of people coming through the doors. They don't, they don't know how to present themselves professionally. They don't know how to communicate. They cannot pass a drug screening test. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really what we touch on in our training programs. So we, uh, months ago, we ran a little preliminary needs assessment here in Sheboygan County. We met with a few companies here in Sheboygan. Uh, some of you are sitting here in the room, Johnsonville, uh, Sargento. Uh, we had a couple of the hotels here. Um, Rockland Industries, American Autoclonics was part of this whole thing. And we found that in just a small, uh, about eight companies we had in our, in our uh, needs assessment, in just the next 36 months, just between these eight companies, we're needing about a thousand people to come into Sheboygan to work. And all of these companies were experiencing the same issue. Um, we know from studies uh, run by Dane and the, and the, uh, the Economic Development Corporation is that the population of Sheboygan is actually declining. The medium age in Sheboygan is going up. So we need to bring in uh, new talent, younger talent, back into Sheboygan. <laughs> One of the things we uh, we do uh, we we do at the Chamber of Commerce here, and, and we represent, as I said, with the Hispanic community, the average age of the Hispanic in the United States and in the state is around 26 years old, and the average age of the Hispanic born in the United States is about 17. So, uh, and we're the grow as the fastest growing uh, ethnic group in the United States as well. So you know where your workforce is coming from now. Um, so, uh, let's see. So going back a little bit into the talent initiative, um, we have created what we call the HCCW uh, CEO Economic Leadership Committee. So we engage companies like Johnson Controls, the CEO of Johnson Controls, uh, Mr. Alex Molinaroli, is the one that chairs the, the committee. We have uh, the chairman of ITW, it's Illinois Tool Works. And the reason Illinois Tool Works is engaged in this is because they have a huge company out in Appleton called Miller Electric. Um, Miller Electric has been a wonderful partner to our training initiative. They have uh, supported us through our first uh, round of uh, fast forward which we were able to engage uh, individuals in our training to create welders. And for all of you that are aware of welding and, and the, the, the skills that someone needs to learn for welding, you may know that it's one of the hardest uh, skilled uh, positions that, to train. We trained uh, and graduated around the state in about 16 weeks, 120 welders, and we have 85% of uh, placement rate for those welders. They're doing very well. We have uh, individuals that have gone from unemployed uh, individuals that run out of uh, unemployment benefits to some of them making $26, $28 an hour now. So very successful program. So through this uh, strategic partnership, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we have partnered with uh, the Workforce Development Boards, Department of Workforce Development, and many uh, technical colleges around the state. Um, MMAC, everything's running and around workforce development. Uh, our training program was uh, recognized by the American Welding Society and we're uh, support, uh, being supported as well. We have received support uh, from them as well and they uh, are now talking about uh, how do we run up to do it on a, on a nationwide basis. Like, oh, we 
got to let us finish with Wisconsin first, and we'll move on to uh, So uh, the key components of, of this uh, partnership is collaborative ex executive leadership. We want to make sure that those leaders are in the forefront of this uh, training initiative, in the forefront of this initiative, workforce development initiative, and that's to attract that private public funding. Um, our training program, uh, as I said, includes this essential life skills training with program support, and the program support is really case managing of these individuals. Uh, we case manage individuals from the day they come into the training program, from the day they're engaged, until after they're placed in their place of employment. So we want to make sure that those individuals, even after they graduate from the training program, they're able to maintain that job. And so we work with them in order to, to do that. Uh, we, in partnership with uh, the technical colleges, we uh, help these individuals get the technical skills that they need. And also we work with employers uh, that offer on-the-job training to so know that it's not everything that you need to learn, if you need to learn in the classroom, you need to do it hands-on. So we're trying to develop this pipeline of high-growth Hispanic and non-Hispanic workforce with outstanding work ethic. Uh, very important to mention that even though we're Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we're Hispanic Focus, we welcome anyone and everyone to our training programs and any of their programs that we have in the Hispanic Chamber. Um, we create this collaborative uh, employer, uh, HCCW employer relationship, and what that is is we uh, are in touch with human resources professionals because we want to know how our individuals graduating from the training program is doing. Uh, so we want to find out first, and first of all, how can we help that specific individual? And second of all, how is it that we uh, tweak our training program in order to start producing better individuals and put them in the workforce? Uh, we, in the case of Cheboygan, for example, we have started the, the partnership with a couple of manufacturing companies, uh, Johnsonville and Sargento in specific. We have presented a, a, a proposal for funding, and we're going to start uh, recruiting individuals for those two companies, training them and placing them at those two companies, but we know that because of the low unemployment rate, eventually we're going to have to move into the relocation and resettlement. So we know the unemployment rate that we uh, were talking about here in Sheboygan is about 4%, but we also know that in pockets in Milwaukee, for example, there's uh, pockets in, in that community where unemployment rate is above 10%. So we can engage those individuals, take them through our training program, make sure that they meet all the requirements of our training program, and then help them resettle, relocate to Sheboygan, for example. And this is happening around the state. And very purposely, we say relocation and resettlement, because it's very different to grab somebody from Milwaukee and bring them into Sheboygan and drop them in the middle of Sheboygan and say, here you go then create a support system around that individual in order for, individ for that individual to acclimate to the new community and feel part of the community, which enhances the possibility of that individual staying in that community. And that's what we want. And uh, also the placement and engagement and retention of that individual, wherever that individual ends up. So, um, that's how uh, the model of our training initiative, we like to look at, we do a lot of pyramids of Hispanic Chamber. Somebody once told me, oh yeah, you took me through the, the tour of Egypt the other day when I was here, because we do a lot of pyramids. But really, uh, this is the, the, the core of our training initiative. And as you see, we have the many uh, corporate partners, the government grants, so which makes this a, pub, a private, private public initiative is participation of those two sectors. Um, so our individuals, it's a, it's a graduating process, so what we do is we, uh, through our outreach, a grassroots outreach uh, type of uh, initiative, we engage individuals into our training program and bring them back from the bottom half of the, uh, of the pyramid. So we bring this underutilized workforce that's recruited, is motivated, and inspired to come into the training program, and one of the uh, specific things we do is we, we use an attraction model. Uh, so instead of advertise, we attract people to come to us. We 
motivate. I mean, it's a trust, a trusting relationship that gets created. We use individuals that go out in the streets and engage individuals one on one. And so once we uh, bring these individuals and we uh, do an assessment of them, we basically go through a one-on-one -on -one orientation, the same type of, I'm sorry, a one-on-one -on -one interview, the same type of interview that any HR professional would go through, and we assess the individuals. Where are they at? What would they need? And depending on where are they, where they are at, are they ready to come into our training program, or we need to work with them a little farther in order to get them ready for the training program. So once we, once we do that, then we bring them into our training. Very uh, important part of the training is that we actually pay our trainees uh, to go through the training program. And that's, that does two things. We're, we're, we're talking a lot about underutilized individuals. And what, what we mean by that is individuals that are working a minimum wage job, $758 an hour. So those are individuals that are living every day at risk, and they're living uh, under under the pressure of living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. They're living in crisis. So if I tell that individual, you know, leave your job for four hours a day and come and train and sit in this classroom, and they have to make the, the, the option, am I going to go and make $8 an hour so I can pay for the next meal for my kids, or do I go and sit in uh, uh, the classroom for four hours and not make any money? So we mitigate that by saying, if you come and sit down here for four hours and you actually participate So if they participate, actively participate in everything else, we'll pay you ten dollars an hour to sit down. Mm. And by the way, at the end of the training program, there's a job that can pay you twelve, thirteen, fifteen, eighteen dollars an hour. Then the picture is a little different. And then they graduate after they go through our essential life skills training. They graduate into um, the technical training or on-the-job training. So this is either they go to a technical college, and which through the private-public partnership, we pay for their tuition. And through the partnership we get with the technical colleges, we customize the training. So these individuals are going to technical training at the technical colleges, but it's only about 12 to, 16, uh, 12 to 16 weeks. It's a, an intensive training program. But once they graduate, they have essential skills and the basic skills in order to go into the manufacturing sector. Um, so talking a little bit more extensively about the outreach recruitment of settlement, part of it is, again, as I said, it's a very grassroots type of effort for feet on the streets, that attraction strategy. Um, with our standards, because we hire these people into our essential life skills training program, they become part of our payroll. So we engage them into an employer-employee relationship, and we're able to draw, uh, run drug screening tests, key verifies, uh, background checks, uh, and we actually have them take a tape test as well. They take a test for adult basic education. Uh, some other technical colleges use the uh, Axis, or what's the name of the other test? Accuplacer. Accuplacer, there you go. And uh, we also ask them about their willingness to relocate and resettle. It's not, it's not something that's uh, mandatory that they need to relocate and resettle, but we ask them so we know who would be willing to uproot and go somewhere else. One of the reasons we do this, very important to mention, I guess, is because we keep the same standards as a manufacturing company would. We don't want to have to go through, go put our resources to work for somebody that at the end of the training program is going to go and fail the drug, drug screening test and then be back to zero. Uh, if, for example, something like that would happen, then we refer that individual to AODA counseling. Once that, once that person is rehabbed, then that person is welcome to uh, join back into the program. With our support system is a one-on-one -on -one case management, uh, and we also do interactive group setting support. We pair our individuals with mentors, and this is once they come into the on-the-job training site. They're uh, paired with somebody that works in the industry and they're mentored. We offer tutoring and remediation classes, so if their English levels are low or their math levels are low, for example, we, we do that as well. And we're working on uh, the affordable housing and affordable transportation. Uh, this is uh, through, a part, through the partnership with uh, Johnson Controls. Uh, we're working now to get uh, uh, Mark Field, the CEO of Fort Moore Company, 
to a meeting here in Milwaukee um, in late this year. And what we're working on is uh, uh, preparing a program that would provide about 4,000 vehicles at an affordable rate, new vehicles, uh, for people that go through our workforce. So, and the reason why we're doing that is, for example, we had uh, Teddy, an individual that went through our training program down in Milwaukee, very good individual, did great in our training program, graduated, lives in Milwaukee, got a job and managed our trains in Fort Washington. Bought a, bought, he bought a vehicle, about $1,600 vehicle, started driving up and back and forth to Manitowoc about two weeks later, car broke down. $3,000 to fix the $1,600 car. <laughs> and he didn't have the money, of course. So this is something that we're seeing uh, over and over and over. So if we can create a, 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 this partnership, the, the partnership we're working on where these individuals can pay $160, $170 for a brand new car, it won't be a, you know, a, 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 a top top vehicle will be your Ford Focus or your Ford Fiesta, but it will be something reliable that you, you know will take you back and forth from work. Uh, we provide financial education and financial access, and uh, something very important about financial access is um, a lot of these individuals, for example, because of their uh, past history, are not, not, not able to open up a checking account. And there's many employers, employers out there that will hire people where you're able to direct the positive checks. So if you're not able to direct the positive checks, just because of that, they may not be selected for the job. So we work on those type of situations as well. Um, and we uh, evaluate them on their academic achievement and behavioral performance. So we keep them at this, again, at the same <coughs> standards as a manufacturing company would. Yeah, we, uh, we have uh, several uh, trainees, for example, that are still working with POs. Uh, in WASA, for, for some reason, in WASA, we had several uh, uh, individuals that went through our training program that were actually inmates. Um, so we work closely with their POs, and their POs provide letters of recommendation, and, and we would provide a letter of recommendation and a certificate saying this individual has graduated from the training program. And there's definitely something to say about somebody that has gone through uh, a 16-week training program and somebody that showed up every single day, that somebody that really showed the commitment and drive to complete a training program. You know, you might have a past, but now you're here, here now, and you, you know, met all the standards. And, and we're seeing that manufacturing companies now are starting to look outside of the box and saying, yes, you know what, come on in and prove, prove to us that you're worth our, our investment. Uh, essential life skills, as I said before, it's um, a lot of the soft skills that we've talked about, communication skills, computer skills, personal finances, uh, time management and uh, punctuality, uh, problem solving, uh, troubleshooting, and that kind of stuff. And, and really our meat and potatoes, and we've been talking about this uh, for a little while, now, the meat and potatoes of, of our training program. And the technical training, as I mentioned before, or on the job training, this is in partnership with local technical colleges through this customized curriculum. Uh, and it's flexible in order for uh, those individuals that are working, that may be working full time or part time in that minimum wage job. So we offer these trainings and we work with the technical colleges to offer it uh, at the afternoons, in the evenings, Saturdays, weekends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of the things that we also encourage is the continuing education after placement. And very purposefully, uh, we work closely with companies uh, that offer tuition reimbursement uh, benefits. Very important to also mention is that this piece is the technical college credits earned. So when we uh, work with technical colleges, we make sure that the technical training these individuals receive is backed up with credits. So individuals are graduating from our training program with five, six, seven, eight credits. 
So once they find the job, once they are placed in the job, once they prove their uh, good investment for the company they're working for, they can go back to those technical colleges and complete and complete their education. Um, and at the end of the the, the program, guess what? There's no student debt. There's no education debt, right? So these individuals completed their certifications, completed their training program, and they didn't pay a penny out of the pocket. Uh, so we're seeing pro uh, proven results. As I said, we have an 85% placement rate. Um, we're producing responsible, punctual, accountable individuals. They're, they have great drive to succeed. They're committed. Um, they're filling our entry-level positions. They have college credits, so they've actually uh, proven that they're able to learn. And that's something that we also hear a lot from our employers, is we need individuals that are able to learn. Um, and they become, you know, they prove the company that they're uh, worth the partner investment. Um, as I said, right now it's about 85, 86% of our placement rate. Uh, so what we see here in Sheboygan County as, uh, as, as success factors, and we've met, met with, as I mentioned before, with many manufacturing companies here, and we've worked closely with the, the, the Economic Development Corporation, is developing um, this, these two pieces here are very, very key. Uh, the affordable housing, it's uh, a huge, huge uh, component we need to focus on. Um, uh, Dane had uh, shared some data last, last year where, um, according to a study, I believe there were about 12 units of affordable housing available in Chiboy County, 12. We're talking about affordable housing, so the type of rent that somebody paying and uh, working at an entry-level manufacturing job may be able to afford. We need to fix that. Um, the financial access and microfinance, where uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has a revolving loan fund, and we're able to help through this revolving loan fund individuals that need access to microfinance, and we also work with uh, other um, uh, financial institutions in order to provide that. We've talked about the, the resettlement and community, community engagement and retention uh, piece as well that we need to work on. And uh, in order to work on all of these things, we, need, we, we have created this workforce investment fund, and we're working towards this workforce investment fund. This is uh, uh, the, the, the ecosystem for the investment in which we have, again, private public uh, investors <coughs> that will invest in this workforce investment fund. And uh, basically what happens here is, I want to show a picture of uh, some meetings that we had, again, with the governor um, and many manufacturing leaders throughout the state. There's a representative from Miller Electric, for example, uh, Mr. John Peterson from uh, Shooty Metals, um, up in Wasa. So the investment fund is, uh, we are able to access the, the type of investment we want to access because the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce meets the regulatory compliance based on the controller uh, because we're an LMI-focused institution, low and moderate income institution. There is about $30 billion uh, of untapped resources that are ready to be deployed in this specific sector. And uh, just in 2013 alone, for example, $7 billion was invested uh, throughout the state or throughout the nation. But there's you know, a huge amount of money left there that never gets tapped. Um, so we are targeting to bring about $500 million yeah, $500 million here to the state of Wisconsin and deploying it throughout the state of Wisconsin uh, in order to uh, help us solve, solve these issues. And one of the key components where that money can be used is for affordable housing. So bringing in uh, the, the, the leadership of Mr. Molina Roli, bringing in the leadership of Mr. Uh, the CEO of Ford, uh, and the leadership from elected officials and leadership of uh, uh, manufacturing companies like yours, for example, will be able to uh, put enough pressure 
into these investments in order to repeat those investments and bring them into into to, into Wisconsin. So again, it's going to help us uh, with deal flow, which is you know, a, a, and bringing in more workforce into your manufacturing companies. Uh, make sure that we have a, the housing stock we need in order to house those individuals, making sure those individuals have access to transportation and uh, that access to the financial access they need in order to uh, continue the growth. So what this would create in the state of Wisconsin, uh, it's about 109 million in average annual new uh, state and local income in sales and property taxes generated by this $500 million and about $1.2 billion in estimated uh, local uh, taxes, income, uh, income taxes and state and local uh, government in the next 10 year, uh, 10 year cycle of this fund. So uh, what we're needing from uh, leaders in Sheboygan is to support, is the leadership and support so we have, and, and we're establishing this uh, Sheboygan County CEO leadership. So uh, again, there's not too many meeting, meetings involved. It's just the leadership when it's needed. Um, we will engage you in this public policy, Wisconsin public policy, so we can bring this uh, effort up to the state and national government uh, and engage strategic philanthropy uh, in order to develop the fund. Um, so we've moved through some of this. We are getting the job descriptions of companies that we're working for. We have developed the training curriculum uh, and we're going to be recruiting and resettling people into Sheboygan County with the companies that we're working with right now. Uh, we need more partners. We're looking into partnering with other organizations and the other thing we're going to also be doing is uh, in a few months from now, we're going to be sending you a letter asking you for your signature and support of this investment fund. Um, so I, that's uh, what we have here in the presentation. I don't know if there's any other questions. I have a question. You um, mentioned that you have a Yeah, and in, in, in it varies through our communities here in Sheboygan. For example, we're working in the food manufacturing industry. Uh, we have deployed resources uh, for road construction. We uh, run a, a, a training program and we graduated about 60 individuals that went directly to placement for the road construction. We're also working on a statewide um, uh, initiative to develop a CDL training program for CDL drivers. So uh, we're, we have a lot of a lot of fires on right now that we're working on statewide. What's the uh, participation from the Department of Workforce Development in the state of Wisconsin? Are they subsidizing anything presently, or is this something that you are working on creating that stream of funding? We have a really good partnership with the Department of Workforce Development through Pass Forward. Um, in the 2014-2015 cycle, we were the largest recipient in the private sector. We received 400,000, which is the max that you can receive from Pass Forward. And we have applied again this year for 400,000 for the continuing of that program and actually also applied in partnership with other manufacturing companies for other dollars for uh, different projects as well. May I ask just one last question on this side? What's the development of the program that you've done uh, and then some collaboration Uh, no, it's it's challenging. It's definitely, we all know that it's challenging to get funding, right? Yeah. Um, Department of Workforce Development, they uh, 
they uh, they have the limitations on what they can fund, and a lot of most of the funding that comes through that through through the Department of Workforce Development and fast forward is for technical training. Uh, so that that those funds get routed directly to uh, technical colleges for technical training. And what we need uh, assistance with, uh, and that where that's where the private uh, partnership comes in, and a lot of companies get it, and uh, some companies don't. Is the funds in order to deploy the necessary resources in order to go out in the communities and recruit and engage the people that need to get engaged into this training program, so we can create that pipeline of individuals coming in. Um, in in Milwaukee, for example, and just to give you an idea. Um, there's, we're working with a company called Super Steel. They came to us last year, about May of last year or June of last year, and said, we need 50 welders. And we thought to ourselves, we're training 120 around the state, and we need another 50 just from Milwaukee. So we went to and presented a, a, a proposal for Fast Forward with Core Granted. They were running their, their human resources department was offering a thousand dollar signing bonus for people coming through the doors and that got uh, hired. They couldn't get people in the door. We run our deployment, we deployed our resources and run our recruitment uh, efforts. We didn't any, offer any money whatsoever and the first day we got 40 people in the door, 48 people in the door. So it's just because of how you do the recruitment and where you do your recruitment, it's, it's really, where, where it is, and, and that's where we're, we're looking for those resources in order to deploy the necessary people and the necessary uh, resources in order to bring people into those jobs. Could you talk a little about that recruitment? What, what does that entail? Is it, I mean, is it people on the streets? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's literally people on the streets. We, we call it the HCCW street teams. So we uh, hire people, we use people that have graduated from our training programs and our staff, and we go out in the communities and we visit uh, fast food restaurants, hate us, because we, <laughs> uh, we go into fast food restaurants, we go into laundry mats, we go into gas stations, we're in, in the community and talking with people face to face. Uh, and we, what we were saying before is we empower them into the process. So it's their decision to come in and we're not trying to pull them into the program. Uh, so we give them all the information for them to make an educated decision and want to participate into the program. And then they, we create that one-on-one -on -one relationship. So through that process, they're always talking with the same person. And it's you know, someone that went through the training program, somebody that looks like them, talks like them, or has, gone in, you know, has been in the same situation as they, have, or as they are and not too, too long ago. So, in a lot of uh, the recruit, the, the recruits that we're getting now are people that are somewhat related to the trainees we had before. So. You say that you tapped into the research inside the workforce wants to develop and you have a leadership and organizations that are trying to draw people into training. The money is not going to. You tapped into the modern workforce while leadership continues to to um, organize their team. Both. Uh, we run uh, training programs like the welding training program, for example, where um, we run it for the community, and then as individuals are graduating into the process, we start engaging employers to place those individuals. <coughs> but really, what we prefer is to work with companies that are in need of those individuals. And when we do our recruitment and we customize our training program, we're doing it with that company in mind. So if you're a company that needs 30, that's gonna hire 30 individuals in the next 12 months, we will work with your rec recruitment uh, or with the HR department in order to, and actually the HR department is very involved in the whole entire recruitment process and training program, and we customize every single step 
be the culture of that company or organization. So we've done it in both. For us, it's very difficult to train one or two or three people. Our groups need to be a little bit bigger than that in order to be efficient, in order to achieve those efficiencies. But we've done it in, in, both, in both types of settings. I'm just curious why a separate chamber had to be formed. What about um, people from Bosnia or Caucasians? Or I mean, it sounds like a great program for a lot of people. Yeah, it, we work closely with uh, the African American Chamber of Commerce, for example, and there's uh, the Hmong American Chambers of Commerce. And why do we have to? Do, what about diversity? Why? Why do we have to? It just seems odd to me that we have to segment. That. Yeah. Well, and as I said, the trainings and, and for that matter, every single one of our programs is open to everyone and anyone that comes through the doors. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I can I can tell you because I've seen it. Uh, if you go down to our training uh, classroom in Milwaukee, um, about 40% is Hispanic, 40% is African American, mm -hmm. and the rest is a mix. If you go up to our training program up in Wausau, 70% uh, is white, 20% is Hmong, and 10% is Hispanic. So it, it changes. I mean, it, it just happens to be that the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce program, but our training programs are open to everyone and anyone in the community that fits the eligibility requirements for the program. You mentioned earlier about the housing shortage here. Um, obviously, if we have a declining population, uh, the risk to the builders is, is there for sure, but could you explain maybe a little bit more why this continues to exist and maybe offer a couple of solutions to that? Well, in terms of the housing, that's probably the best one to answer that. Uh, yes, over the last few years, the population of the county did decline. In 2014, it did go up. So I think we've turned that corner and once again growing. Now, the, the reality is with apartments, right? First, the good news is, is there's projects on the way. I'm going to tell you that right now. I suspect no less than probably three to 400 units breaking ground in the next year. We've been very active seeking out developers and getting things going. Two potential projects in our downtown, those are more luxury that would not be here at all. Um, an existing apartment broke ground on Union Avenue, they're building it right now, and I've got two projects up in the town of Sheboygan that will probably be breaking ground. So I think uh, we're going to see a lot different multifamily landscape here. Having said that, the reality of building apartments right now is they're about eighty to $90,000 a unit to build, which means you got to rent them like a one, two bedroom for $800, $900 a month. Now our current market right now, if you're an apartment owner, give your hand, if anyone own an apartment? If anyone owns, if I were you, I'd start jacking up those rents because no one's got any other choice right now. Um, seriously, I'm not even joking on that. Uh, these apartments have been full for well, probably about a year. But the reality is, is that to build them now, you're at 850, the current market says six to 700, and so a lenders, for, who are my lenders out there? Right, you know that you're gonna lend on 600 to 700 a month, you're not gonna lend on 800, but they need to get the performa to work, quite simply, because that's what the market says it can support. So that's the catch 22 we're in right now. That's why many of these developers, especially in the downtown projects, have been working closely with the city to try to essentially get districts in place to try to provide an incentive to get them over that gap. Once that new market is established, the next units probably won't need an incentive because now the lenders can kick in and perform a proper ROI. And we're not the only community. You look at Oshkosh, Wausau, Eau Claire, they're all in the same boat we are. When you see apartments being built like crazy right now in Madison and Milwaukee, it's because those apartment rates have been achieved and so the numbers weren't there and so they're hammering out apartments left and right. On the plug on the state level, Wisconsin does not have a very robust apartment thing overall. And the, and the big reason is, is there's no secondary market in apartments. They're very small. Because the average developer loves to build a cookie cutter unit, occupy it, three years later, sell it, build the next one, create the capital to build the next one. That's how it's done in almost every other state except for Wisconsin. And Wisconsin developers have to hold on for the useful life of that facility, 20, 30 years. Maybe they'll sell it off to someone that can rehab it. Maybe they'll stick more money into it. Maybe get another 20 years out of it. The combination that we have that apartment buildings are assessed at 100% of their construction value, combined with the fact of our high property tax climate, basically means there's no secondary market. Because if you're one of those secondary firms going out and buying a, an apartment, 
It's quite simply the tax rate. You can get 11% in Minnesota or 10 and a half in Wisconsin. You're buying the Minnesota unit that Minnesota developers build in next, the next one. So that's why Wisconsin has a very stagnant apartment complex. That's what developers who do stuff all over the place tell me. The reality is, I think apartments are coming. The other part is, when we talk about workforce housing, you know, we start to get into the realities of, okay, someone's making $13 to $18 an hour, depending on the manufacturing firm, what can they really afford? It's just them, maybe 500 a month, maybe there's two going together, maybe 800 a month is probably where they would be. So a two bedroom at 800 might work. You know, then we get into tax credit housing. And politically, that's a very tough sell in a community like this. But the reality is, if, if we want to grow our community, it's something that we may need to consider. Um, but I will say that there's plenty still. Um, we have a very robust slumlord population here in the community. So um, there are still housing available. It's probably not at the level that we want to show off our I don't know if that answered your question. Good answer. Uh, follow up to that. Would it would it take something like um, the employees? Let's say somebody needs thirty welders or you know twenty uh, this or that and the other. Well, where are these folks going to live? Obviously, you know we have a shortage of housing. Either maybe the employers could gather a coalition, maybe using this funding investment <coughs> source that you're referring to, and you know throw up a sixty unit apartment building. I, I'm aware of several uh, companies that are openly said they're willing to invest, especially if we're project in Plymouth. So if anyone wants to pull together something there. Um, most of our employers have said they'll pre-lease and just give us some plans and we'll, we'll lease 20, we'll sign a master lease and obviously that makes the bank very happy because there's one third of the units guaranteed. Um, none of these developers, these five projects have taken advantage of that. Uh, they basically have said, when I said, I've got local investors willing to invest, and i got companies willing to pre-lease, they just kind of skip that part and like, okay, we need to be here. You know, when I, when I, it's kind of interesting. You know, say you got local investors, and if you give them a plan, they'll put money into it. Uh, they're just like, well, then why would I put my money into it? And forget them. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the reaction we're getting, which is great. It solves the problem, but uh, um, I've been very curious to see how these first couple, especially the, the luxury ones in the downtown, and see what that does, because if they occupy immediately, I think we'll see more building right after it. So I, I think my biggest challenge is that multifamily is, is right now Plymouth. That's the area I'm now focused in on. So just let you know the work. Without anything, I just want to personally say thank you for your time. Thank you to the Thank you, gentlemen. You did a great job and kept everybody mesmerized for long after the time that we like to keep them. So that was even better. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Just a couple quick notes. Um, two coastal things that are coming up. Um, August 12th, we have behind the scenes at RCS. Um, and that was Craig who was asking all those questions in the background. So please come and see what they're doing out there. August 18th, there's an after five at the Sheboygan Rifle and Pistol Club. Very exciting. And um, next Friday forum is actually going to be changed due to Labor Day. So that will be September 11th. Um, it will be the first impressions of Sheboygan County. Sheboygan and Kenosha's chambers will present info gathered from focus groups held with newcomers and a collaboration with, with Kenosha on first impressions, all geared toward the attraction of potential workforce. So, we invite you all to join us. That's on September 11th, right after. And I hope you all have a lovely August. I hear there's a big thing going on in a few days. Right? I think it involves walls. Yeah? Okay. Well, I hope you all enjoy that if you get a chance to go. Have a great afternoon. Take care.